Okay, so thank you everybody for coming today. Um, uh, today I have the great privilege to introduce my mentor here, Gaetano De Ferrari, who was uh, the main reason why I first came here at Duke, and uh, now is the main reason why I'm trying to go back uh, in my country to do some clinical research over there while continuing my collaboration with Duke. So Gaetano was uh, the head, has been the head of the CCU for uh, the last 10 years, and uh, he has, I think, very different interest in the field of cardiology. And uh, today he's going to talk uh, about, uh, I think, a topic that is very exciting and uh, deals with uh, his experience in um, autonomic nervous system from myocardial ischemia in the transition from heart failure and uh, specifically talking about the device he has contributed to the vault on uh, vagus nerve stimulation. So look forward to that. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Thank you, Sergio, for the kind introductory remarks. And uh, let me tell you that it is, of course, for me a great honor to have the privilege to uh, give a talk here at the Duke Clinical Research Center. Now, uh, before we go to the direct argument uh, of the talk, as Sergio was mentioning, we would give you some background on the place we come from. This is the University Hospital in Pavia, which is linked to a pretty old university. As a matter of fact, it's one of the oldest in the world and was founded in 1361. This is 650 years ago. And it has a very strong medical tradition. For instance, Marcantonio de la Torre was a very eminent young professor in anatomy and he often lectured together with Leonardo da Vinci in the early 1500s. And he, when he died prematurely, exactly 500 years ago, they had together studied the anatomy and the physiology of the heart. And this led to the first scientific representation of the heart and circulation, which was made, as you may know, by Leonardo da Vinci exactly 500 years ago. A few centuries later, other important uh, physicians and scientists work in our university hospital. And for instance, Antonio Scarpa, uh, who had the chair of uh, anatomy and surgery, is considered to be the father of modern surgery. Uh, Carlo Forlanini, you may know because he invented the pneumothorax, which was uh, the turning point, the treatment of tuberculosis. And uh, also Camillo Golgi, who you may know because he won the Nobel Prize and was working in our university hospital as a pathologist and a neurologist, and he won the Nobel Prize uh, for his uh, discovery of the Golgi organelles. Now, unfortunately, 100 years have elapsed uh, since this Nobel Prize, and this has uh, have witnessed, I would say, a certain form of decline for Italy, which has become very important in the past few years, also due to our political reasons, and therefore Pavia, unfortunately, was not exempt from this relative decline. Now, the purpose of my visit here would be, of course, to try to strengthen up this relationship between Duke and our university hospital in Pavia. We already have some relationship. For instance, I am the national lead uh, coordinator of two major trials being coordinated by Duke, such as the Improve It trial and the Trade to p trial. But we would like this to become stronger, to have uh, uh, sparks and electricity coming from Duke and going to revitalize our old institution. And when I speak of electricity, it is not by chance, because bear in mind that electricity was discovered in Pavia by Alessandro Volta in the early 1800s, who was also the first person to discover and to master the battery, as you know. And the name Volta, of course, comes from this Pavia professor. Now, also, there is another reason that he, as you know, performed nerve stimulation on the frog leg. That is, you know, following Galvani's experiment was the whole issue about the discovery of electricity late in the to early 1800s. So this nerve stimulation brings me to the real topic of the talk, which is another nerve stimulation, nerve stimulation of the vagus nerve, as a matter of fact. And an additional reason I chose this argument is because I think it illustrates a relationship between mentor and mentee I've had in the past 20 years that hopefully we will be able to reproduce with Sergio.
Therefore, I would like to acknowledge that most of the experiments that have been performed on this issue have been done under the mentorship first and in collaboration with after Peter J. Schwartz, who some of you may know. Now, for those of you who don't know him, you, I would like to tell you that he loves to be first in everything he does. And I think Dr. Kelly, who is not here, knows that very well, having challenged his golf, European golf team more than once, and not always winning, I believe. Now, uh, the question is, who was the first, however, to perform Vegas simulation to study it? Now, I will tell you that uh, the first investigator to do this had a bird, was called Peter, but it was not Peter Schwartz. It was Peter Einbrot, a European Russian physician in the 1800s. I was lucky enough to find his original manuscript, published by the New, uh, um, Royal Academy of Science in Wien in 1860. This is the result of this lecture on October 29, 1859, that says, über die Herzreizung und ihr Verhältnis zum Blutdruck. This means about heart stimulation and its relationship to blood pressure. Although the uh, manuscript deals mostly with blood pressure, there is a fascinating point which I would like to introduce to you. He was giving electricity by means of uh, an inductorium with two coils that were approached increasing the level of electricity to the heart. Now, when the electricity, I'm sorry, the coil were um, at 90 millimeters distance in their approach, the, this stimulation was tiddly, was mortal. The animal died. There was, of course, no ECG at that time. Eindhoven was not even born, perhaps. But we can understand from the description that the animal died of ventricular fibrillation. And during vagal simulation, he could bring the distance between the two coils of the inductorium up to 30 millimeters, increasing much more the current. Therefore, 125 years before Richard Verrier, Bernard Laun studied the ventricular fibrillation threshold and its influence by vagal simulation, Peter Einbrot already had shown profound antifibrillatory effects of vagal stimulation. I think it is a fascinating demonstration of the power of science, which went completely neglected, however, for 110 years, in which vagal stimulation was considered, if anything, detrimental in the setting of acute myocardial ischemia and in the absence of acute myocardial ischemia. The first turning point came, I'm sorry, by uh, this uh, paper by Benjamin Sherlag, in which he observed anecdotally the interruption of a fast polymorphic ventricular tachycardia during acute myocardial ischemia by means of vagal stimulation. This was an anecdotal finding. And more systematically, the first demonstration of a beneficial effect of vagal stimulation comes from this work by Myers, where you can see that the percent of animal uh, surviving to myocardial ischemia is significantly increased by low intensity vagal simulation and even more by high intensity vagal simulation. Also, he has checked the effect of heart rate and observed that heart rate was a mechanism but not the sole mechanism of the beneficial effect provided by vagal simulation. This concept will come forward and forward again. Now, I personally became interested in vagal simulation when I have performed my thesis for graduation. This is a work. I had done at that time uh, analyzing the effects of vagal simulation reperfusion arrhythmias in cats. This is the control group where you can see all animals have either ventricular fibrillation or fast sustained ventricular tachycardia. There is a dramatic reduction, almost abolition, of malignant ventricular arrhythmia during reperfusion by means of vagal simulation. And this effect is uh, to a great extent, but not exclusively, mediated by the heart rate decrease since when you have atrial pacing to bring the heart rate to the same pre-stimulation level, you lose a great part, but not the whole part of the beneficial effect. Now, at that time, uh, PCIs were starting, and it was suggested that reperfusion arrhythmia was not a real clinical problem. Therefore, these data we had provided 25 years ago almost went rather neglected for some time. But I will come back to this issue because I believe that
Vagal activation may be beneficial during a perfusion, and recently there are further documentation about that. Now, all these studies had been performed in anesthetized animals, and I will present to you a model that has uh, allowed us to gain information on what happened in the conscious state. This animal model consists of conscious dogs with a one-month-old myocardial infarction that have a combination of elevated sympathetic activity by means of exercise and a two-minute coronary artery occlusion, that is an exercise and ischemia test that results in the reproducible occurrence of ventricular fibrillation is led to more than half of the animals. Since this behavior is reproducible, we can use the animals as their own control for internal control studies. Now, one of the serendipitous observations that was made is depicted here, where you can see the heart rate of the animal. This is the occlusion of the circumflex coronary artery. And you can see that the heart rate decreases despite continuation of exercise. This is a resistant animal, an animal that does not develop ventricular fibrillation. So it was observed that this pattern was not unique to this animal, but that rather there is a divergent behavior. Animals that are susceptible to sudden death increase their heart rate. Animals that are resistant tend decrease their heart rate, pointing to the potential value of vagal reflexes. Therefore, we decided to study other vagal reflexes in assessing whether they could help us in the prediction of risk. And the choice was made to study baroreflex sensitivity that, as you know, is the relationship between increases in blood pressure and increases uh, in uh, RR interval on the, on the x-axis. Now, um, what we found uh, in a large series of animal studies we have performed mostly in Oklahoma City during the late 80s, it was that the pattern of the reflex sensitivity was markedly different between susceptible animals and resistant animals. So that on the basis of this reflex, of this vagal reflex, we could risk stratify the animals from a very low risk among animals with very high BRS, all the way through a very high risk of ventricular fibrillation, 96%, among animals with very depressed bioreflex sensitivity. Now, this experimental study has been reproduced in the clinic in this large post-infarction study in almost 1,300 patients that conclusively demonstrated that depressed bioreflex sensitivity is indeed associated in the post-myocardial infarction patient to a worse prognosis. Now, of course, this was the demonstration of indirect markers of vagal activity and increased risk. What about the direct demonstration? First of all, we wanted to see whether this pattern that was shown several years ago was still applicable with modern reperfusion techniques, that is PCI, and over the long-term follow-up among patients with preserved left ventricular ejection fraction, which now constitute the great part of our patients. And this study, which was published, I think, three years ago in the JAK, you have seen that even with modern treatment, contemporary treatment, but reflex sensitivity identifies over the long term, we have a six-year follow-up, patients that are at a very high risk compared to patients with preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. And importantly, you see the huge difference among patients with depressed uh, here in red or with normal bioreflex sensitivity in green in their five-year mortality. This holds true for patients below age of 65 and for patients above age of 65. So we have shown that even among the population of patients at relatively low risk because of preserved left ventricular ejection fraction, we can identify by means of depressed vagal reflex as a subgroup that is at very high risk because of this abnormality. So coming back to the question I was mentioning before, is it indeed that vagal reflexes are themselves protective? And this was the issue of an old work that you see here where we have simply uh, given atropine to assess what happened when we blocked vagal reflexes. At that time, you can see that uh, you uh, render approximately 25% of the resistant animals, you make them susceptible because you induce in them ventricular fibrillation. Therefore, we concluded that vagal reflexes were indeed the sole responsible mechanism for protection from ventricular fibrillation, approximately 25% of the animals.
Of course, we can see it the other way around. What happens if we increase vagal activity by means of vagal simulation? This study is important because it was the first time ever that vagal simulation was given to a conscious individual. In this sense, it was a conscious animal. And we had assessed the effects in a large study where we uh, underwent uh, a repeated exercise in ischemia test, either with vagal simulation or in the control group here on the right. As you can see, the incidence of repeated ventricular fibrillation was extremely high, 92% in the control group. It went in a dramatic reduction to 15% after vagal stimulation. So we have shown in the conscious animal that vagal stimulation has profound antifibrillatory effects. Similarly to previous studies, we, we can skip this, we can see that part of the effect were heart rate dependent and part was heart rate independent as you can see by the fact that half of the animals uh, develop again ventricular fibrillation when atrial pacing is performed at the same heart rate than we saw before vagal stimulation. So we have shown that indeed in conscious individual vagal stimulation has a profound antifibrillatory, antiarrhythmic effect which is only partially mediated by the decrease in heart rate. Now we have very little information on what occurs in patients actually. This is one of the few studies we had performed long time ago, in which we have given phenylephrine to provoke vagal reflexes. As you can see, these are simple PVCs or couplets in patients with frequent ventricular arrhythmia. We completely abolish by means of vagal activation this arrhythmia, chronic arrhythmia, in these patients with ischemic heart disease for the majority. And then part of the effect, again, is heart rate dependent, part of it is heart rate independent, as you can see by the uh, intermediate level of PVCs when pacing, atrial pacing, brings back to the same heart rate as in background. So before we go into uh, very expensive methods to increase vagal activity such as vagal stimulators, I would like to point out that there are certainly several ways to increase vagal activity. One potential way I do not want to go into, but that may be familiar to some of you, is spinal cord stimulation, which certainly uh, has as a final effect a significant increase in vagal activity. The group of Doug Zipe have done very nice work on this issue. There are other means I would like to introduce to you, and the first and simplest is exercise training. For instance, it was shown that in dogs, post-infarction dogs, that undergo exercise training, there is a marked change in their bioreflex sensitivity that is associated with the fact that they become from susceptible closed circle to resistant open circle. In other words, you can modify vagal reflexes and accordingly you modify the risk for sudden cardiac death. This has been somehow mimicked by clinical study in which uh, 95 patients post MI were randomized to either six weeks of exercise training or a control pharmacological traditional treatment. And as you can see, the patients that were trained and had a beneficial training, that is an increase in their bioreflex sensitivity by at least three milliseconds per millimeter of mercury, had a significantly better prognosis compared to patients that were either non-trained or in few cases trained but without a change in their bioreflex sensitivity, what we can call an inefficient training. Now, I would like to speak to you of another method to increase uh, vagal activity that I found rather fascinating. This Russian physician, who is called Zamotrinsky, uh, takes advantage of the fact that in the ear there are sensory endings of the vagus, and that by electroacupuncture of this part of the ear, exactly this position here, you can increase vagal activity. As a matter of fact, he has done this in a series of studies. I will present just one of these studies. But before doing that, I would like to tell you that this is not a big surprise, because actually the traditional Chinese um, medicine knew that the ear was very important, and following the Noger's inverted facus theory, the ear is the depiction of the whole body. And actually, if you look to this uh, um, scheme here, you see that the heart is right exactly in the same point where Tsamotrinsky makes his vagal simulation. So not only there are vagal sensory endings there, but this is exactly the position of the heart. And not surprisingly, the results appear very positive. Now, in patients with uh, uh, intractable angina undergoing bypass surgery, 
you see after a few sessions of electroacupuncture of the position which is called Shen 1. I understand heart 1 in Chinese, at least I don't know Chinese, but I hope it's true. You see a decrease of heart rate of 12 beats per minute from 76 to 63, and you see the complete abolition of the use of nitroglycerin in these patients, indicating vagal activation and a substantial improvement in their ischemic heart disease symptoms. So I think this is a fascinating story also. Now, um, could vagal simulation exert positive actions additional to that on arrhythmia that is theoretical up to now? I would like to go simply for one moment back to my previous slide on our study on reperfusion arrhythmias because I believe that the cascade of events that leads to reperfusion arrhythmia is very similar to the cascade of events that leads to reperfusion damage that now we know it's a very important component of myocardial reperfusion. So therefore, although our study was neglected for 20 years, now there are several studies in the past couple of years who are actually looking to the effect of vagal activity on ischemia and reperfusion models. This is one of the most important ones I would like to bring you. It's a recent study published last year by a Japanese group suggesting that uh, short-term vagal simulation markedly influenced the response to ischemia and reperfusion. You see, this is a rabbit in the control condition after ischemia reperfusion, a lot of polymorphonuclear infiltration. This is the same rabbit in the, abs I'm sorry, in the presence of vagal simulation. You see a marked difference. Not only, please concentrate here on the upper panel. You see, this is the pressure volume relationship in normal rabbit hearts, rabbit hearts following ischemia and reperfusion. And as you can see, with vagal simulation, you almost normalize the important hemodynamic derangement due to ischemia and reperfusion. And this is a clear picture of the effects of vagal simulation in this animal model. A huge remodeling process in the control animal and a very minor remodeling process in the animal that undergoes a brief period of vagal simulation during ischemia and reperfusion sessions. So I think a very marked effect. What about heart failure? Now for heart failure, at variance with what happened with arrhythmia, we started from the clinical observation and they went back to the experimental observation. And indeed, one of the most important observations it was that bariflex sensitivity, which we had shown to be important for patient post-myocardial infarction, was a powerful risk stratifier also among patients with heart failure. On this basis, uh, there was a seminal study made by the group of Kenji Suganawa in Japan of vagal simulation in a rat model of ischemic heart failure. And what he has done in this elegant study with micro-stimulators in the rat, in telemetry to the computer, a technically very demanding experiment, he has given heart uh, um, rate reduction, as you can see, this is the sham treated heart failure, this is the heart failure with vagal simulation, reducing a heart rate by approximately 30 beats per minute from 350 to 320 beats per minute. So a 10%, 8% beat uh, reduction by means of uh, four weeks of vagal stimulation. And what he has shown, let us concentrate on a couple of these panels, for instance, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, marked increase in the ischemic model compared to sham operation, and a reduction due to vagal simulation, the same left ventricular DP over DT, a dramatic reduction, of course, in the heart failure model, which is partially reverted by vagal stimulation. So beneficial hemodynamic effect in this chronic rect model. And perhaps more impressive is the survival of these animals. You can see here that vagal simulation was capable of improving survival from 50% in the sham group to 85% in the vagal stimulation group. A very powerful uh, um, effect on total mortality in this rat model. One uh, additional model uh, is that of the, um, you may be familiar with, is that of Tony Henny Sabah in the Harry Ford Institute of uh, Microembolic Heart Failure. And he has also studied vagal stimulation to assess whether it had beneficial effects on top of that provided by beta blockers. As you see here, 
This is left ventricular and systolic volume. You see a beneficial effect of beta blockers compared to the dilation, progressive dilation in the control group. This effect appears more marked when you add vagal stimulation to beta blocker. And the same is true for left ventricular ejection fraction. Progressive decline in the control group and increase with beta blocker and apparently greater decrease with beta blocker and vagal stimulation. An additional study was made when we already had started our clinical study by Tsang, published uh, uh, one and a half years ago. And they have uh, performed a model, which is a different heart filler model, that is a high ventricular pacing, high rate ventricular pacing. This is important, first, because it is a different model. Second, because, of course, vagal simulation does not change heart rate, because heart rate is kept constant by ventricular pacing. Despite the absence of a change in heart rate, you can see that there has been a significant difference between the two groups. Let us concentrate on left ventricular ejection fraction baseline, four weeks spacing, eight weeks spacing, progressive decline in the group uh, control group, and this decline is significantly less in the group of dogs. This is a dog model uh, who are subjected to vagal simulation at the same time without any change in heart rate. The next slide shows that not only we have hemodynamic effect, but we have effect on C-reactive protein, on norepinephrine, and on angiotensin II. Now, the question may come, this anti or apparent anti-inflammatory effect, does it come out of the blue? Was it completely unexpected? Now, I can tell you that it was not unexpected, actually, because more than 10 years have elapsed since the seminal work of Tracy. This is his review publication in Nature 2002 on the profound anti-inflammatory effect of vagal stimulation. He has shown that vagal stimulation blocks endothelial cell activation and leukocyte recruitment during inflammation. And uh, a lot of cytokines production is inhibited by means of vagal stimulation. For instance, in this study, again in Nature 2000, by his group, you see that in human macrophage cultures, there is a dose-dependent decrease by means of acetylcholine on the production of interleukin-6 in response to LPS. Also in rats subjected to toxic shock, vagal stimulation incredibly prolongs survival and improves survival uh, as single effect during electric vagal stimulation, so a powerful anti-inflammatory effect. So, good news. After this very long background, I come to the last part of the talk, which is the presentation of this first human study of vagal stimulation in patients with congestive heart failure. Now, this was an international multicenter study that was started a single site study in Pavia and then one extended, was extended to other centers in Italy, Germany, Serbia, and the Netherlands. And we, of course, being a first in men study, we had, of course, as main goal to assess feasibility and safety of chronic vagal simulation and also to provide preliminary efficacy data on this new therapeutic approach. Now, we wanted to include patients in New York Heart Association 2 and 3 in sinus rhythm with an average 24 heart rate between 60 and 100 beats per minute, who were in optical medical treatment and with a depressed left ventricular ejection fraction. We have a series of contraindications which is similar to main studies. In addition, I would like to mention that we excluded patients with diabetes uh, uh, mellitus, which was insulin dependent, with active pectic disease, and with atrial fibrillation in the previous three months, as well as patients who were candidate for CRT in order to understand the effect independent of CRT. We enrolled 32 patients, relatively young patients with a long history of heart failure, mostly ischemic patients, and with a great depression, left ventricular ejection fraction, as you can see here, with un under optical, optimal medical treatment. Now, let us come to the protocol of this study. We perform a baseline study. Then we may have surgical implantation of the system here, three weeks of healing, three weeks of uh, uh, careful up titration of the 
intensity, because this needs to be up titrated, and then six months of follow-up. This is the system, which was manufactured by an Israeli company called Biocontrol, with an intracardiac electrode to sense the heart rate, and a vagal stimulation coil that goes around the vagus nerve. As you can see from this x-ray, this is the cuff electrode, and this is the cartoon that depicts the position on the cervical vagus. This is an intraoperative picture of the carotid artery, the vagus nerve, and the jugular vein, and it would be positioned around here. We gave pulse synchronous stimulation of quasi-trapezoidal waves of half a millisecond duration, and the intensity of stimulation was on the average 4.1 milliamps with a duty cycle around 20%. Being a safety study, we were first interested in adverse event. As you can see, there is a series of adverse events such as pain at stimulation site, cough and dysphonia, that were actually expected on the basis of the experience of vagal stimulation in patients with refractory epilepsy. And this adverse event resolved after fine-tuning of the stimulation intensity or after patient adaptation. The serious adverse event includes death and uh, um, pulmonary edema. We believe this was not due to the device, experimental treatment, but rather to the underlying condition. And there were two uh, adverse events related to the device, the need of a surgical revision because it was not tightly connected, and one post-operative pulmonary edema which occurred in one patient. Now this is an example of a patient with a very high starting baseline heart rate that is subjected to vagal stimulation with 10 seconds off and 30 seconds off. The on seconds are the blue crosses. You see that every time the vagal stimulation is turned on, you have a significant decrease in heart rate. Now, to tell you the truth, the instantaneous decrease in heart rate on the average in this study was rather modest. Then is, this is one of the two most significant reductions we have seen, and therefore I have chosen it for the picture. But despite this, the baseline heart rate on the average did decrease during the six months from a baseline of 82 beats per minute to an average of 76 beats per minute during the six months of the study. This depicts the trajectory of every single patient. As you can see, we observed a reduction in the New York Heart Class Association definition in almost every patient, and by six months we had an improvement in more than half of the patients. Of course, this is relatively subjective, and the placebo effect could play a role there. The same applies for quality of life, a significant reduction at three months, and maintenance of this effect at six months, as well as for six-minute walk test, a significant increase, and then maintenance at six months. Again, potentially a placebo effect. Now, the echocardiogram, however, was assessed blindly in a core lab, and as you can see here, we saw no significant change in left ventricular and diastolic volume index here, but a significant and progressive decrease in left ventricular and systolic volume in the orange columns. Therefore, overall, left ventricular ejection fraction significantly increased during this uh, six months of the study from 22% to almost 29%. And this was, of course, a significant increase and was assessed by blind analysis of the echocardiograms. Therefore, I think we can conclude this talk by saying that this first uh, human study has shown that chronic vagal stimulation in patients with advanced congestive heart failure is feasible and appears to be well tolerated and safe. Our preliminary data suggest that there is subjective and objective improvement. And we concluded um, our uh, manuscript saying that a larger control study appeared absolutely warranted. And in the very last slide, I would like to show you that this uh, uh, suggestion was taken rather seriously. As a matter of fact, uh, there are two studies controlled by Biocontrol together with Medtronic and Medtronic itself that assess two different ways of increasing by means of electric stimulation vagal activity.
This follows exactly the same uh, um, type of electrode we had uh, um, kind of mastered in our previous study. The company is the same, now is sponsored by Medtronic. This study is called Innovate HF. It should be recruiting any day now. This study is on spinal cord stimulation. It's a different technique, but I think it's very similar. It should be discussed together in terms of a way of manipulating the autonomic nervous system. And finally, this study I'm involved in the uh, steering committee in, which is chaired by uh, Fayez Zanad, which I understand will be here in Duke in a couple of days, uh, is uh, sponsored by Boston Scientific, and it's still a phase two study with a different uh, new device. So I believe that uh, following these studies, we'll be soon in the condition to see whether indeed, as we believe we are facing now a new era in which we will see uh, neural manipulation of the autonomic nervous system for improving the cardiac condition of our patients with heart failure and potentially with other cardiac diseases. This would be the end. Thank you. Wonderful uh, talk, the, the, the history and leading us up to the, the present. I'm sure there are some, some questions. If it's all right, I'll, I'll start. You presented the data that was com particularly compelling in the context of acute myocardial infarction and reperfusion. Uh, have there been any, any trials looking at vagal nerve stimulation in, in that setting? Yeah, you're shaking your head no. Absolutely no. Yes. Because as I was saying, the, the concept that it may be beneficial during reperfusion came from our study that was neglected on arrhythmias. And then these one on our animal study in the past two to three years. But if I would be extremely interested to study this issue because I think um, what we know is that uh, vagal stimulation could be a very good way of making post-conditioning. Um, it has a lot of similarities to other ways that uh, uh, produce post-conditioning. There are studies that it affects the uh, mitochondrial permeability pore, which has a major role in the reperfusion damage. The experimental studies by Japanese group seeing that in the animal very, very clearly, but they're very recent, and there is no clinical application yet, not even foreseen to my knowledge, but I think it would be fascinating. And just quickly, uh, did you see a change in blood pressure in, in your first in human studies? And if so, is this a treatment potentially for refractory hypertension? We did not see really a, a significant effect on blood pressure. This is a population of patients that, as you may imagine, advanced heart failure. They're around 95 millimeters of mercury in blood pressure to start with. Now, uh, there is a system that uh, stimulates the carotid bar receptors you may be familiar with uh, that has had some very powerful results in a phase two trials, but then the phase three trial has been interrupted. Uh, um, <laughs> is, uh, and they had uh, a continuous stimulation which was bilateral. It varies with our study that was unilateral on the right side. So by stimulating, it was a field simulation over the carotid artery and potentially simulating the afferent component of the baroreceptors. They showed they could reduce blood pressure by approximately 30 millimeters of mercury over the long term. But um, it's not really clear why the study was then interrupted. I was curious to know. I think it's called the Rails system, the, the company that, that makes it. So first off, thank you for visiting us and Thank you for sending us Sergio, who's been doing such a terrific job here. A um, couple questions. Uh, the first is, in, in your uh, first in man experience, where you show that the change in uh, the echo parameters, how did you treat the dead patients in those analyses? Were, were they just discarded from the analysis, or was there, some, uh, was there some imputation done? And then secondly, in your experience of the trial, any insight into the mechanism besides heart rate? Is there any biomarker information that's of interest to understand it mechanistically? So, of course, you're right. We did exclude in that analysis the three <laughs> patients who died at the six months. As a matter of fact, they died even before the three months. So we do not have a follow-up echo or, or, or centralized on these patients. So we could not analyze them in any case. But we should bear in mind that these could be part of the non-responders, of course, absolutely.
agree on that. And we do have uh, some data um, which, uh, unfortunately, are not complete uh, on uh, BNP, which showed a reduction just of borderline significance. And we don't have much more than that. But uh, our impression is that uh, heart rate was not a major mechanism and that other mechanisms may be involved. And I try to suggest that the anti-inflammatory mechanism is a good candidate for a beneficial effect. It has been shown that there is anti-apoptotic mechanisms that are very powerful with fecal simulation that could play a role. There is certainly an increase in nitric oxide that could mediate a series of cascade of events that are relatively powerful. And uh, this is more or less all. There is an anti-adrenergic effect which is clearly independent on heart rate of the ventricular ladder postsynaptic, which may be quite important. Because with beta blockers, we don't really block completely the, the effects uh, postsynaptically. And by uh, the direct antagonism at the level of the uh, cyclic AMP and post-transcriptional levels, I think we can somehow be a stronger antiadrenergic mechanism by increasing beta simulation compared to the pharmacologic beta blockade, I believe. So this could play a role, I, I believe. Good. Uh, Ken, you had a question. Yeah, I was very, uh, very much enjoyed the talk, um, especially in the introduction with the, the history it laid out. We don't often uh, see that these days, and it's nice and refreshing. As you and I chatted earlier today, we're obviously delighted to have Sergio here and, and having you come and visit our institution, um, and your commitment to his success is, is admirable, and, admirable and appreciated. I was very much interested in the inflammatory hypothesis that you postulated, and It'll be nice to see. It sounds like you do have some blood samples um, from your first uh, inhuman experience. And we've got a group here um, that has done a lot of work in the inflammatory process and acute myocardial infarction. So my question then is, there, there's a lot of opportunities here. And you and I chatted briefly this morning. How do you envision academic centers such as your own doing research like this and our, our center here at Duke doing research how do you envision groups like ours getting together? And how, perhaps, can we position Sergio to help in uh, those collaborations? So a little bit of an open question, but it'd be nice to hear your thoughts. It's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I really uh, think we have to, to discuss this uh, carefully, because I was mentioning before that uh, Italy is facing some part of decline. Therefore, presently, we have uh, in terms of practical point of view, to stick to a non, uh, uh, I would say, a statal source of financing. So I think we should take advantage of studies like this one uh, to try to study mechanism, which I believe, I think, has been the success of Duke in this past 20 years. They have gathered money from the company who was interested in a drug or in a protocol, but they had sufficient enough to explore mechanism in terms of, of gene background, of inflammatory markers, of whatever. Now, for instance, in this case, the situation is a little bit difficult because now the company with whom we collaborated has joined an agreement with Medtronic who has decided to completely change the team. For instance, I was completely excluded from the further follow-up of that study. So I, I know there is the blood there in a central laboratory, but I really don't know exactly, for instance, from a practical point of view, what type of analysis I still can perform on this. Being a first-in-man study, we had some ideas, for, even in the field of microRNAs, for instance. We uh, uh, issued a question whether we could analyze microRNAs of these, of these patients to see whether something was building up new, and, uh, and we're still awaiting an answer. So coming to the broader question, I think what we need to do is, at least for Italy, to find, unfortunately, sources of financing that are coming mostly from private companies within this type of trials and use them as best as we can to have academical uh, uh, sub-studies or, or mechanistic studies built on that, because I think this is unfortunately presently the only real practical way to solve the research because the public financing is, is miserable in it in the past years. I, I have to be unfortunately sincere about that. <laughs> Maybe the Prime Minister would be willing to take some of his billions of dollars. <laughs> that's, that's a different question. Uh, <laughs> Joe and, and Chris? Um, yeah, that, so so f really fascinating. Thanks for um, for sharing this. Um, and a 
Maybe we're now, and I think, Rick, you were implying this, maybe with the um, excitement about renal artery adrenergic denervation, we're in, a, uh, we're in an era of affecting the adrenergic nervous system in a variety of ways to, uh, to improve clinical outcomes if some of these things pan out. A couple of questions. Did, does this affect adenosine at, at all? Do, how, what, what role does that have to play in the... Um, um, uh, in vagal nerve stimulation? I'm not aware of many studies. You're speaking of the reperfusion damage or in general? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, adenosine also continues to be, and of course, a lot of the work done in Italy with adenosine, it continues to be this really interesting um, and, um, um, you know, pathway that, that perhaps, and, and I don't know, maybe um, um, ticagrelor, these, the survival effects of ticagrelor, some have speculated that might be due to an adenosine effect. Um, we have the, the I, I think adenosine works as a myocardial protectant to some extent, um, but and, and, and is that part of the mechanism? Might that be part of the mechanism here? I don't know. I think the, the main postulated mechanism in terms of uh, the prevention of the perfusion damage is a profound anti-inflammatory effect that is mediated by the nicotine alpha-7 receptors. This is relatively well known. There is a, a a colleague of ours who is presently working on experimental study blocking the uh, alpha-7 nicotinic receptor during vagal simulation and she saw that uh, the beneficial effect of vagal simulation reperfusion remodeling was strongly prevented. So certainly that mechanism is working and is uh, mediating the anti-inflammatory effects on polymorphonuclear infiltrates and also playing a role in the noroflow phenomenon. This is uh, something that we know for sure. Then there is the nitric oxide pathway, which is greatly increased by vagal simulation for sure. Whereas, to tell you the truth, I'm not exactly uh, familiar of studies that have tried to put that into correlation with uh, intracellular adenosine. So I'm not really sure I can completely answer your point. Yeah. Uh, another question was, was digoxin has some effect, of course, on the parasympathetic nervous system on I don't know if it's through vagal nerve activity at all, or, but, but it, does that tie in? Can we learn anything from... Uh, well, I, I think it was a good drug before, before the Americans used it at a high dose. I think that's the whole issue <laughs> for, for many drugs. I mean, amiodarone is a wonderful drug before the Americans used it at, a, at the triple dose they needed. I think this... The, the, Thanks very much. The, you, 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 you have some problems in understanding dose arranging, I believe, but... <laughs> I mean, I think it is a good drug. It actually sensitizes the, the carotid bioreceptor. It is considered that sensitization of carotid bioreceptor is probably the main mechanism of the parasympathomimetic effect of adenosine, I'm sorry, of uh, digitalis, which I think that at low dose, it's, it's a good drug. I, I would like to hear the experts in heart failure what they believe, but I think that uh, it probably has been overused for a long time, probably it's being underused, I would, I would believe now, because it does increase the parasympathetic activity. Joe, maybe you'll take that on. So. <laughs> 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 um, but, but, you know, oftentimes when we do early phase um, drug trials, we do a dose ranging study. And presumably with these devices, you can alter the amount of vagal stimulation that you can provide to a subject. So how, how do you decide how much vagal stimulation to provide is question one. And then secondarily, so sort of just looking at these patients, they have an awful lot of hardware. And you propose that maybe um, tragal acupuncture might provide a similar kind of benefit, and would you ever consider a trial of, uh, you know, an implanted device versus something much more homeopathic, potentially, like uh, an acupuncture approach? Now, the first question is, of course, very critical. Uh, I was writing a review recently on this argument, and I found 10 different ways of changing the intensity of vagal simulation. It's not simply like a drug, so that you give a dose and that's over. You could uh, change amplitude, intensity, frequency, coupling interval, uh, uh, direction of stimulation, potentially bidirectionally, afferent, efferent, although bidirectionality is always present to a some extent, uh, uh, bilateral versus monolateral, uh, with the short uh, poses, long poses, duty cycles, there is a wealth of changes you can do. And unfortunately, uh, um, we have not been able to produce uh, like a phase 2B study as we wanted uh, 
because the company we were working with has joined Medtronic and they decided to go directly to a phase three study, huge study of like 600 patients, huge investment, but it's not the big company who decides and we had no choice in making any decision on that. I strongly believe that uh, in, like a dose response curve would have been very useful. And as a matter of fact, we will be trying to do that in animals at least to see if there is a minimal dose which is needed. Now, it is interesting because there is a study by the new company that now is interested in this field, Boston Scientific, I was mentioning, is sponsoring the last trial. They are still interested in making a phase two trial, and potentially they would be interested in helping also making a dose response study because they have done a study in the animal model by Tony Sabah where they gave stimulation at levels which did not change heart rate. And apparently this had already beneficial effects. Now, all of these small number studies made in that laboratory never come up with a real statistical description. So it's more like a qualitative study, at least in my, in my perception, than real hard data. But certainly it's, it's promising that even low levels may be beneficial. And uh, the second question is, of course, uh, I, I didn't know, know about it before I had to write this review, this electroacupuncture. Of course, I wrote one year ago or so. And I read a little bit about it. It's very interesting. Now, the fact that it seems that acupuncture by itself is probably less efficacious than electroacupuncture. So you have to give some kind of electricity, not simply putting the needle on. And I think the, the difficulty with this type of research is that I, I don't see a, a sponsor who is likely to, to sponsor a comparison between something which is very economical, like exercise training, for instance, in heart failure could in some patients, in some instances, be performed in a very critical way and still it's difficult to perform appropriate randomized trials. So I think acupuncture lies a little bit in the same area where it is difficult to find financing for this. Uh, for this. But I would be certainly interested to contribute if you find funds. <laughs> uh, Chris, final word? Uh, great talk. The, uh, um, talk about the independence of, and you mentioned it a little bit just in your last comments, uh, uh, the independence of uh, the vagal stimulation above and beyond adequate beta blockade. And I was really pleased to hear that Dr. Granger thought that adrenergic uh, uh, response and blockade was important in heart failure. That's a really profound statement. But when you go back to your, could you go back to your yeah. slide that had the heart rate changes? Um, thanks, Chris, for uh, educating the fellows. <laughs> it looks to me in, in, in experiments that are going to have to go forward, this is sort of a class two heart failure uh, population, that uh, patients with heart rates resting at 82 is really not demonstrating uh, adequate beta blockade. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, uh, it was difficult to find the patients. We had to, um, to look for a patient who had an average heart rate between 60 and 100 on the halter and uh, who were willing to, to start a completely experimental treatment with a completely new device. So there were quite severe patients, especially the first one we have enrolled in Pavia, who were no option, were refused from heart transplantacy because of high pulmonary resistances of other causes, were a little bit a last option patient. And in some of these, the beta blocker, for pulmonary reasons or other reasons, could not be titrated to the level which you would normally expect. Now, I think this is a problem. It is more so a problem in the Evabradin trial, where you see that you have beneficial effect of patients who are absolutely not targeted. I, this, this is my opinion, to a appropriate heart rate. So this is also a problem here as well. It's not, I think, a big problem in the sense that uh, um, we will uh, uh, see a heart rate reduction by vagal simulation, but it is a little bit a problem because I believe that if we select patients with uh, higher levels of adrenergic activity which are not sufficiently blocked by beta adrenergic blockers with the limitation I told, we are likely to see more responders. As a matter of fact, I made an analysis between responders and non-responders and patients who are responders tend to have a higher heart rate. So it is likely that patients who are not for several reasons, whatever it is, are not completely anti-adrenergically treated or, or insufficiently or because they don't tolerate it are better candidates to vagal simulation. Perhaps because you add something more of anti-adrenergic effect compared to what you add in a patient that is perfectly anti-adrenergically treated.
So I, I am in agreement with you, but I do believe that there is additional effects, and we will see it uh, hopefully in one of these trials that I believe will enroll patients with a starting heart rate that is probably similar to what is the standard of care now, probably around 65 or whatever. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Ferrari for an excellent bench-to-bedside example, and thank you for being here.